and then I use that information to be compiled so I can make conclusions about your beliefs and behaviors. Actually, that's creepy. Well, I checked the legal precedent for creepy. It's not. Why are you doing this? I'm taking you from terrorists. You're insane. All right, you might not think that you love me, but it's still my job to protect you. I'm not that man. That's, that's silly. He doesn't have a suit of powers. I'm more like Aquaman, the land Aquaman. Instead of commanding the fish, I command everybody. You don't command me. You're an arrogant jerk who screws up everything he touches. You talked me into racking up $40,000 in student debt. You forced me into a healthcare plan I couldn't afford. <coughs> you ruined my business. You spent all of my money. We're done. And stop fighting on me. Alexis, don't forget about me. Oh, I will. I'll remember you every time I write a check to pay my student loan. Oh, good. So you're still paying those. Is that uh, any big deal with um, collecting data? You guys find that? So a lot of people say, I don't care, I have nothing to hide. Right? How many people are kind of in that boat that you don't really mind if the government's you know, collecting that stuff? Nobody? I mean, I've heard, I mean, there's an argument there to be made that I've got nothing to hide if they're just uh, getting the bad guys, if that helps get the terrorists. Uh, I'll put away. Thoughts on that? Those of you who are don't liking it, why? What's that? Invasion of privacy. So, um, why does that bother you? Lack of trust. So you think you already have kind of a trust, just not knowing who's going to have the stuff. But can't we trust our government? <coughs> Uh, some people are laughing. Why are you laughing? I, I, I mean, I think in some cases we trust the government. Yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, there's trade-offs, right? Uh, what do you guys think back here? Who's saying? Yeah. Why? Why is that? What have they done to you besides protect you and, and uh, keep you healthy with good food for school lunches during your K through 12 time? How dare you? Uh, what, what, why would there be, you know, what, what have they done? I mean, seriously, I don't think, can any of you guys give me a decent thing of what they've done to harm you, or are you just kind of paranoid? Or is it because your mom or dad feel that? Okay, that's an interesting one. So uh, Ashley said there was, uh, they cut the school food lunches down, and so there was, People having kind of health problems, either passing out because they didn't get enough food in them. Yeah, we take some. I was at Applebee's last night. Was any of you? Yeah, you were there, right? Uh, give me Lance. Lance. Uh, anybody else was with Lance's group? So I, I was at Applebee's after my son's soccer game, and, and so you get some of Lance's group. What was that? The whole offense, defensive line it seemed like all you guys are pretty big hombres. That was the old line. Okay, so yeah, the old line comes in, and I'm just thinking when when uh, Michelle Obama helped pass through the legislation on the school lunch thing, they've got those guys who are probably close to that big in high school on the same program as as some of the other more 
normal size, me sized people, I think I'm normal anyway. I might be a little, little short, but uh, I think I'm in the low end of the normal range. So, right? So, you know, that sort of thing. That's a good, that's a good example. Um, you know, the school lunch is what what does it do for choice? <laughs> Limits choice, right? And so, um, as an economist, that of our things uh, we said more is preferred to less. In other words, if you have more choice, kind of some of the underlying uh, microeconomic principles there is that that makes you better off. Now, sometimes you must, you got to admit, I, I even admit, in fact, this just happened to me the other day, that sometimes like too much choice, I'm like, oh, I got to really think through this. I'd almost rather have fewer choices, right? So once in a while you run into that. But for the most part, if you have more choice, then you are better off. You're better off with more choice. You have more opportunities, right? Opportunities at your disposal. And so anytime uh, there's a, re a restriction in choice, there's potentially a restriction in, in your happiness or your utility. Well, that's the whole voluntary part of the market system. And how is the, what did we call the tax system? Tax and spend, was that all your involuntary? Involuntary, right? So that is being imposed on everyone. Now, some people agree with it, right? And so they're not made any worse off. They're like, oh, yeah, I would have, I would have put my money towards that particular cause anyway, so no big deal, right? I, I wasn't made any worse off. But if it restricted somebody's choice, somebody else was made worse off, right? So anytime there's additional restrictions, um, it, it starts to be uh, potentially leading to lower happiness of some individuals. And then we get into the whole, well, happiness trade-off, which is a tough one. Um, the United States, for the most part, was built on this kind of individual entrepreneurial spirit, and so we have uh, a lot of um, history in thinking that that's one of our important foundational concepts. Um, so we don't necessarily like the idea of somebody else telling us what's best for ourselves, or we need to help those people out, so we're going to take some money from you and do it over here. And So if you, if you have this perception that um, the government has enough data, metadata, like LoveGov was doing there, if they have enough data, are they actually able to make society better off because the happiness I take away from Kylie, uh, Ike's happiness is, is bigger. So if I take money from Kylie and I give it to Ike, right, her loss of happiness is smaller than Ike's gain in happiness. So from society standpoint, that was a good move. But what did we learn about comparing happiness in Chapter 8? Yeah. You can't do it. And so that's been kind of proven wrong. That was a, a concept that was formulated by some early economists. And it, it's just saying that, that that's, not, that's not logical. It has some flaws. We still might want to do it. And through a democracy of majority voting, maybe we still want to have some of that uh, collective action. But the economist in me always wants to say, anytime we have a potential opportunity for voluntary action, as opposed to forced action, that would be a better path. And uh, we talked about this before. Sometimes as technology evolves, it allows us to have more voluntary action, but our old ways are kind of stuck with us. So it's kind of like, well, the government's always provided education. What do you mean we can have a private school system with vouchers where students could go to whatever school they choose to? If you live in this area, the government said that the kids in this area go to this school, and, and the government provides a school. The government's the best provider of, of education. Right? Again, those choices are being restricted. Sometimes it might not get the best outcome, and perhaps there's often outcomes that can be better as technology evolves to bring back voluntary action into the picture. So when I say the word voluntary action, that's really market action. And so I, almost, I like to kind of use the word voluntary because market, market society or capitalism, for God's sake, uh, that would be even worse. But market-based stuff, well, there's got to be something bad. That's kind of chaotic. Nobody's, nobody's controlling it. There's no central planner that's, that's governing it. Uh, but hopefully what we get from this class is that there is a lot of um, coordinated behavior that occurs with people who don't know each other. 
and that's the invisible hand of the marketplace that Adam Smith talked about. Um, that people who don't know each other can have uh, coordinated actions and lead to win-win situations. All right, so that's just some of the awesome stuff of why I, I love this topic. Um, any other questions or comments on government that you have for me? Here, and you can go any, any other direction. I just think that that security thing is a big one right now with, with terrorism. I, I think I left my thing in my other bag. I was going to do one thing, but I guess I won't do that. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm uh, in Alaska and there's no state right now. Yes. So we have city patches. Oh. Like, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, so huh. um, I was wondering if that would be voluntary, involuntary. Still involuntary, yes. So, so, so it's decided by the Right, right. So when we think of voluntary, it's at an individual level. So yes, they voted on it in a democratic process, majority wins. But majority wins means 60 people were in favor of it, 40 people got screwed. So to the 40 people, it's involuntary, right? And so it was something that was uh, passed along to everyone, whatever that rule was. And, you know, maybe it was fair according to some people, but unfair according to others. Um, so anytime you don't have a choice, you have to pay the tax. It's an involuntary uh, tax. And, and like I said, it might, for those people who were in favor of it, the point I was trying to make earlier, the people who were in favor of the change, they didn't see a reduction in happiness necessarily because it was in their choice set. Um, let me, now th this is where you guys hopefully are are able to digest some of the tools that we've started to learn in this class. Kind of similar to the production possibilities frontier. Let's say there's a, a trade-off between uh, education and guns, weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction, WMD. And as a society, we have to make choices. The production possibilities frontier tells us that we could be at A, B, or C, right? We could be at A, B, or C. Where do we want to be at? And this is where you get into the 60%, the 40%, is that if we're not at the, as a collective of 100 people, if people choose to be at uh, A, um, where we've got this many guns and this much education, there's other people who voted to be more at C. And so these people are okay with that. That was within their happiness range, right? But these people have a reduction in happiness because they're forced to pay for something that they wouldn't have chose to do on their own, right? Okay? Any other questions or comments? <laughs> All right, so... Um, Today, we get into uh, check the next chapter. So that was it for what your module, uh, this module is for this week for Sunday's test. And uh, the next module is, is a longer one. So we're going we're gonna to start uh, today with uh, a deeper dive into the property equation. What are profits? Let's put, let's put some equation goggles on for starters. Profit equals, maybe you didn't hear me. Profit equals revenue minus cost. So total revenue minus total cost, right? <laughs> and we've got total revenue as a formula would be for a single product company like a lemonade stand, price times quantity. And then how could we break this down a little bit further? If we look at total cost per unit, what do we call that? Uh, that's part of the components, but average total cost, right? So if we do average total cost times quantity, this is kind of a nifty way of writing this because it's like, Oh, my lemonade, I, I can sell for a buck, and the average cost per glass was 20 cents. So on average, I was making 
uh, 80 cents a glass, so we can kind of rewrite this as price minus my average total cost per unit times the number of units I sold. So different ways of thinking about the profit equation, and sometimes you need to pull off um, any one of these to answer a question. So a question might give you just the total revenue, or they might give you some price and average total cost information. So you got to be able to go uh, back and forth between these two. Okay, questions there? So um, chapter 11, what we're testing on this Sunday, was really hammering this. Right? That's what we spent all of our time on, was the total cost side for chapter 11. And now for the next uh, three chapters, for sure, uh, the next two modules, we're going to focus our time on this and this. It's still, we're not leaving this, but we're building onto it with a lot of the focus coming in on the, on the revenue side. So the first thing I want to cover is where we're going with this, with what I call the spectrum of competition. So competition is an important ingredient in a healthy capitalist market system. Why is competition so important? Okay, limits the amount of power the company has over the price. I like that. What are some other things? There's yeah, lower prices. Good, just lower prices in general for consumers, right? What else? Competition. Yeah. Okay, supply equals demand, you're right. So that, that helps make the market more, uh, what we call liquid is kind of a fancy word, right? Supply equals demand. And I'll tell you, just to give you a quick example, like real estate market, um, they sometimes have trouble coming to that equilibrium sometimes because the quantity of homes don't, doesn't quite match the demand. And so let's say an area is starting to boom, you can't just go pop up houses real fast, right? They take a... You know, if you build one fast, it'd be like three months, but three, six, three to six months to a year. So sometimes it's a time for supply to catch up with demand. And so if there's an increase in demand real fast, that'll drive current prices up of the existing stock. And so sometimes that market uh, takes a while to, to adjust. Whereas commodities markets for pork bellies on in the Chicago Board of Trade, is a commodity where there's thousands of trades going on. There's buyers and sellers all the time. Same thing on Wall Street. If you want to go sell some of your Apple stock, there's a buyer today, right now. You could jump on the phone, jump on your smartphone and sell your Apple stock. There's going to be a buyer, right? There's, so there's a very, lots of buyers, lots of sellers help us get to equilibrium price fairly quickly. So that's a, that's a good benefit. It keeps things uh, moving. Um, what about on the seller side for profits? Profits as a signal. If there's lots of big money being made, kind of an obnoxious amount of money, money that almost doesn't seem fair, what does competition do? It's going to grow with competition? Profit of an individual firm. So in, in an industry, there's lots of profit being made. What's going to tend to happen to those profits over time with there's, if there's healthy competition? It's going to go down, right? And it, it, it ties right into, I'm sorry, give me your name again, glasses. Zach. Zach. What Zach said about prices, right? Prices go down, total revenue goes down, profits go down. So all of those kind of work in, work in harmony. All right, so I've developed what I call the spectrum of competition. On one end of the spectrum, we have what economists call perfect competition. Perfect competition. It, it's kind of a theoretical abstract. Um, there are some industries that are close, but nothing ever really fits this endpoint. So I, we're just trying to kind of set the stage of where firms might be and then and look at their particular um, situation. Now, the opposite of having tons of firms is having one firm. What do we call that? Monopoly. Monopoly. Good. You guys are familiar with that game, right? 
the goal of the board game is to own everything and have a monopoly. So by definition, monopoly is one seller. There is no competition. So really we've got perfect competition, we've got no competition. And then in the middle, we have a couple hybrids. The one hybrid is called monopolistic competition. Monopolistic, which is kind of a mouthful. Monopolistic competition. And then somewhere to the right of there, in between these two, we have another fun new word for most people, oligopoly. Oligopoly, with an O, O-L-I-G-O-P-O-L-Y, oligopoly. All right, so what we're going to do is mod 5 is this chapter 12. We only have chapter 12 for next week. We're going to spend a lot of time on this one to kind of nurse it along. Remember that we have Wednesday as our in-class test day, so we'll be doing lecture on that day. So today and then Monday and Wednesday will be, or Monday and Friday rather, will be kind of us hitting this perfect competition stuff. We'll just be on this will not be on the midterm. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. So your the midterm will just be through this module four, the the cost stuff, chapter eleven. Okay. So after perfect competition, we're going to jump to the other end of the spectrum, and chapter 13 is about monopoly. And then we come in between, and we we'll go back to monopolistic competition. Chapter 14 and chapter 15. And so we're putting a lot of emphasis on this. So note we got uh, these four chapters kind of hitting these types of things. And so we can start to we'll start to piece together what makes these things you what makes these uh, uh, market structures uh, unique. So all four of these things are what we call market structures. Market structures. All right. And as we work through them, we'll kind of put some tweaks on, and our baseline is going to be perfect competition. All right, so let's look at the characteristics of perfect competition. Number one, there's a large number of firms. Large number of firms. How large? Well, large. What do you mean by large? Well, large. So, if I was to take this garbage can and fill it up with water to about halfway. All right, so imagine this thing full of water. And let's say that it was transparent that you could see through it just to make it easier. And I took an eyedropper and I put one drop of water in. Would you see the water level rise? That's how large. Okay, so a large number of companies. Each company is just a drop of water in the bucket. They're relatively insignificant to the overall market. So a large number of firms, each firm, each firm's output, i.e. quantity, right, the quantity that they produce, each firm's output, and actually let me make that a little Q, we're going to start to make this distinction between the market quantity being big Q, which we did this notation earlier, and little Q meaning a single firm. Each firm's output is relatively insignificant. 
insignificant to the industry output. The industry output is big Q. Each firm's output is relatively insignificant to the industry output. A drop of water in the bucket. Okay, so that's the type of competition we're talking about. We've got potentially thousands of firms. Number two. Each firm sells a homogeneous product. Firms sell a homogeneous product. Homogeneous. What does that mean? The same. So this is basically identical products. Identical products. Homogeneous. One firm's product is a perfect substitute for another. Each firm's quantity, little q, is a perfect sub for another's. Each firm's quantity is a perfect substitute for another's. Can you think of any examples of that in Dorito, the real world? Doritos and Cheetos. What's that? Doritos. Doritos and Cheetos for what type of seller? I mean, I'm, I'm with you a little bit, but what, what, who's the seller? Each firm sells. Oh, that yeah, that's, so I want to come to the store level. So at the grocery store level, grocery stores are selling a homogeneous product because each store is carrying a bag of Cheetos. And if it's a 16 <laughs> bag of Cheetos and you think the price is too high, you can run over to Walmart and buy a 16 ounce bag of Cheetos there, right? And there's no difference between them. They're perfect substitutes. So we see that particular characteristic is possible um, in maybe some other, other market structures as well. All right, any other questions or comments there? So far? All right, our last condition, number three, is free entry and exit. Free entry and exit. What do you figure that means? <coughs> free entry and exit. Let me come back here. Let's get here from somebody I haven't heard from yet. Free entry exit. I heard from you, I heard from you. No cost? No effect. No um, effect. So, no penalty for doing what? For leaving, yeah, right? So, no penalty for, so it's easy. It's, it's easy to exit, it's easy to close down your business, and it's at the same time easy to enter the industry, right? So back to the industry level, if I want to open up a grocery store, how easy is it for me to get in or out? And so, the real world aspect of that could be all over the place. Again, in our theoretical abstract over here, there's free entry and exit. Can you think of any markets that it's pretty easy to enter as a seller? That it's really, really basically free to start your own business and start selling something. What's that? Clothing, how so? Where, but so where, how, what, how are you selling your clothes? On Main Street, on a little shop? Online. Online, right? And what about your inventory? Where are you getting that from? Yeah, does it ever come to you? Not necessarily, right? There was a kind of interesting piece on, uh, oh, plenty of money this morning on the middleman. And, and so um, 
a lot of people said that the internet is great because it eliminates the middleman, right? The person in between you and the seller, because the seller can sell on Amazon or eBay or whatever. But what they found is that the middleman isn't eliminated. So this one guy, the example they gave is this guy had some sort of uh, cat claw thing, you know, those little toys that the cats declaw, they, when they have claws to kind of rag it up or whatever. Something along those lines. I didn't even quite understand what it was. But the guy was selling them for $40 on Amazon. And then what he find is that, oh, his brother called him and said, hey, your uh, thing that you invented is being sold on eBay for 60 bucks." So they were buying from Amazon, from him directly, and reselling it on eBay. And they were able to make some sales, right? So there was a profit opportunity. They apparently, to me, left money on the table. They're, they're not selling them for maybe enough. Or, but there's always buyers out there that maybe they don't go to Amazon. They're kind of eBay people. How many people know some eBay people? Like everything's on eBay, right? Couple, couple shoppers on eBay. That's the way I was before. And then we started to kind of gravitate towards checking both. But a lot of times I would just go to eBay. Oh, that looks like a good thing for my brother for a Christmas gift. Oh, 60 bucks, that sounds reasonable, I'll buy it, right? And so there's a profit opportunity that was left on the table and with free entry, how hard is it to get registered with Amazon to be a seller or eBay? How hard is it to get on eBay registered as a seller? Yeah, like probably take you all 10 minutes, right? Now, you're not going to have a big star rating with reputation factor, but nonetheless, you can get established as a, as a seller fairly fast. So that's an example of free entry and exit. Like, is it easy to start, easy to get in and out of? Uh, there's not a lot of cost involved, maybe, or, or other things. Yeah? Well, if it's similar Yes, and that's, what they were, that's part of what the article was about, is that um, he was sending out messages to the eBay seller that say, hey, I have a patent on this. You know, you're not an authorized seller of this or reseller of it. And, but he found that he was chasing it down all the time, uh, so he stopped using Amazon. He, he quit selling on Amazon, and apparently his rev <coughs> sales revenue uh, went down from 60000 And I don't remember what the time frame was, if he was doing a bang-up thing like 60000 per month or 60000 per year. But it, it went down from 60000 to 25000 and he yanked it off of Amazon because he, didn't, he wanted to control the distribution better. Um, and so that's what they chose to do. So, and, and part of it was it's easier said than done chasing down the legal stuff because you start to incur legal fees and then just the hassle fees. So they were they were kind of mining the internet trying to see who's selling their stuff illegally. So you start to run into those sorts of sorts of costs. All right. So large number of firms, firms sell a homogeneous product, free entry and exit. That's our characteristics for perfect competition. And so we're going to kind of hang our hat on these. You should have all three of these memorized for perfect competition and be able to say large number of firms, uh, firms sell a homogeneous product, free entry and exit. Uh, because that's going to be critical as we start to get into the, uh, the predictions of the model and, and where, this, where this thing takes us. All right, so it is Friday. And so we're going to tell a little story about Jack Daniels. Since we always talk about beer, I figured we'll switch to whiskey. Uh, so Jack Daniels Corporation. Jack Daniels Corporation uh, faces the following costs here. <coughs> Suppose Jack Daniels Corporation faces the following cost structure. Total costs equals $30,000. Total variable cost equals $50,000. Total fixed cost equals
All right. So if <coughs> the profit maximizing uh, quantity, if the profit maximizing quantity, which we'll kind of call Q star, equals 10,000, I'm going to K, I guess. What is average total cost, average variable cost, and average fixed costs? <coughs> yeah, so calculate it out. Total cost, 13. Average variable cost, 5. And then 8, which gives us all the things that we need to know for the test Sunday. Oops, that's a $5. <laughs> and this is $8. $13 per per unit sold, right? So per bottle in this case, if this was bottles, I guess it could have been cases, but I was kind of shooting for bottles. So $13 per bottle. And then we've got the average variable cost and average fixed cost. All right, so um, how does he come up with this quantity? Well, to look at that a little closer, we're going to look at the uh, corn mash that Jack buy from his suppliers, right? So Jack needs corn for production. And I'm going to draw two graphs. Make them nice and big for yourself, side by side. The graph to the left is home base for the corn market. So put big Q. This is back to chapter three. This is the corn market. And go ahead and draw some sort of supply curve, some sort of demand curve. You can put it up here if you want, but now remember the, from last time, since we're starting to talk about costs and other things, you might just want to start to put a dollar sign. And in the corn market, we've got Five dollars a bushel maybe coming out is the equilibrium price, and the equilibrium quantity of a thousand bushels of corn. Maybe that's a thousand, a thousand million, so a billion bushels. We could be measuring in billions. Okay, so when Jack needs to buy corn, mash, and corn for getting his stuff going, he needs to go to the market. He probably buys it refined from space, but this corn in the marketplace came from who? Farms. How many of those are there? Lots, right? So each farmer is probably a drop of water in the bucket, right? If we think of all the farm ground and individual farmers that make corn in the United States, a lot of them are concentrated in Iowa, and uh, I think North Carolina is another spot, and there's a decent amount in Kansas even. So over here, what we're gonna do is look at the 
individual representative farmer. So Farmer Dick. Tom, Dick, and Harry, we're just going to pick on Dick for a little bit. So we got Farmer Dick, and he is what we're going to call the representative, the representative firm. He is one drop of water. Farmer Dick's just one of the drop of waters in the bucket. All right, so if we're trying to think about the price that Farmer Dick thinks he can get for his corn, he's in the farming business, right? <coughs> what price can he expect to get for his production of corn? Five dollars, right? So if he does a hundred acres in corn, he should expect to get five dollars. <coughs> now even if he doubles to 200, how much should he expect to get for his corn? Five dollars. How about if he triples it? Five dollars. Five dollars. Five dollars. Five dollars. So for Farmer Dick's situation, no matter how much he produces, he is relatively insignificant to the market quantity, and so the demand, the demand for his corn is perfectly elastic. elastic. Good, right? A flat line. Here's that extreme case that we talked about in chapter four with elasticities. The demand curve is perfectly elastic. All right. Which makes sense with the substitute concept, right? Because Farmer Dick's corn is not any different than Farmer Tom's corn. Can't distinguish them in the marketplace. So we really have kind of this identical homogeneous product going. So we got lots of farmers, homogeneous product. How about the free entry and exit for farmers? Free entry and exit. Is it the same as my little reselling the clothes on Amazon, eBay? No, I mean, the farmers got, they've got some startup costs, but in general, they can get into the business and out of the business at a small scale, uh, even as little as 10 acres, you could potentially do that uh, with uh, a horse the old fashioned way and do some you know, farming the old fashioned way and you could enter this market too. So it's still relatively easy to get, to get in and out. So agricultural products, are an area that we tend to see a lot of the characteristics with that perfect competition coming into play. All right, so um, how much is the total revenue if Farmer Dick does 100 units? Total revenue, I already erased it, but it was up here. Total revenue if Farmer Dick does 100 bushels of corn. 500, right? Now, Using our rectangles again, $5 is the market price, which was given to us by the market, right? So the market cranks out a price, and we call Farmer Dick a price taker. So note, Farmer Dick is a price taker. He has no power over pricing his corn. I mean, if, if Farmer Dick says, hey, my corn, I, I did really good this year. It's really sweet stuff. Trust me. I'm going to try to price it at $5 and a penny. How much, is it he gonna, uh, how much of it is he going to sell? No. I mean, it's, it's really identical at the end of the day. It's a pretty hard sell him to, uh, to sell that. Um, and so he's going to take the highest price people are willing and able to pay, which is the market price. So Farmer Dick's a price taker because he takes the market price. So if 
farmer <coughs> Dick cranks out 101 bushels, just one more bushel, how much is his total revenue? 505. So what's the marginal revenue of the 101st bushel? Five, right? So the marginal revenue curve is the same as the demand curve <coughs> in perfect competition. Now you guys, you don't have, I just have the advantage of the colors. You can just put D equals MR if you're just writing with your pencil or pen. D equals MR. So demand equals marginal revenue. But it's better for you conceptually to think that they lie on top of each other, right? So demand equals marginal revenue. So because he's a, pr a price taker, note number two, that means the market price equals marginal revenue. Which equals demand. So from the little example we're doing here, the total revenue of 100 units was $500. Price times 100 times 5. Total revenue associated with 101 units was $505. And so what's our new formula for marginal revenue? If you were to put that in an equation, MR equals what? Change in total revenue. Change in total revenue, I love it. That, that sounds good for the top part. I, I said top part, I'm already giving you part of the way. You didn't say anything about the top part. You just said change in total revenue. Divided by the change in quantity, right? And so I kind of gave that away because it's more than just the change in total revenue. In this particular case, it worked out. Why? Because I gave you 101. But what if it went to 200? What is the total revenue associated with 200 bushels of corn being made? 10,000, 1,000, 1,000, right? So five, let me write my five up here, and it's over here too, but that's why we have these side by side. Five times 200 is 1,000, right? So my total revenue went up from at 200 units was actually 1,000. So if we plug and chug that into our formula, the change in total revenue is 1,000 minus 500 equals 500 divided by the change in quantity of 100. Because the quantity went up from 100 to 200. So that works, right? Why? Because some of the problems, you've already seen them in your homework and some other things. Sometimes it goes up by one unit. And then it's like, oh, it's just actually the change in total revenue, which is kind of what I led you to believe here. But when your data gives you big jumps, you got to go back to the real formula, which is this. So that otherwise, when the change in quantity is just one down here, uh, that makes it a little bit easier. Any questions on that? You've seen that in lots of things already. So I just want that, that, that thing is going to, you probably, how many of you have missed some problems on that? You didn't quite get that. Who's going to be brave? Miss the problem. Good, good. Like brave people. Yes. All right. Good. So you, you three get extra credit points because you were the only brave ones that raised your hand. So give me first name, last initial. Go. Pierce. Pearson W. Right. Aiden. Uh, L. You got that funky hyphen. Emma. And Emma. Emma. Hickey. Hickey. H. Got it. All right. So thank you for showing your cards, and hopefully that'll that, that'll help the rest of you get get that for sure down if you didn't have it already. All right. Cool. Um. So that's our revenue situation.
for a firm and perfect competition, right? So we're kind of piecing together the profit equation. Profits equal total revenue minus total cost. We've learned a little bit here that under these circumstances, this ends up being the situation. All right. Is Farmer Dick immune to the law of diminishing marginal product? Is Farmer Dick somehow immune to the law of diminishing marginal product? The law of diminishing marginal product says that as you add more and more of a variable resource, to at least one fixed resource, the amount of additional corn I get from each additional tractor eventually declines, right? Law of diminishing marginal product. Is farmer, uh, farmer Dick immune to that? No. Everybody's said that's why it's the law, right? So if you're a producer, eventually you're going to be subject to that. What did that lead to in terms of costs? The law of diminishing marginal product had an implication on marginal cost. What was it? Look back in your notes. What do you have? Cost goes up. So we also kind of sometimes say the law of increasing cost. So farmer Dick here is not immune to that. So farmer Dick's marginal cost curve is no reason to believe that he wouldn't follow the J shape that we had before, where possibly there's some increasing returns early on in the production process, but eventually cost per bushel are going to go up. So same thing as chapter 11. All right, so how does Farmer Dick maximize profit? What should Farmer Dick do? How, how should Farmer Dick maximize profit? So let's add some quantities. I kind of purposely, hopefully you saw that. I, I should have told you as I was drawing it, but I kind of put this one here. And uh, let's see, we got 200. And we got, let's call this 300. If your graph isn't perfect, that's okay. And then I guess we got a 400. You know, what, what do you think, uh, what should Farmer Dick do? Where are profits maximized? 100? So at 100, we've maximized the distance between marginal revenue and marginal cost. Right? Everybody see that? So graphically, at 100, total revenue, or I'm sorry, marginal revenue is $5. And marginal cost is, uh, let's call it a buck. Any other answers? 300. 300. Why do you say that? Because we still make profit up to that point. Okay, still make a profit up to that point. So, uh, Drew, why don't you come up here for a sec? I like your answer, by the way, just to be supportive. But... I've been explaining this stuff for 20 years. Sometimes it's nice to have a fresh face up here. So kind of explain your logic on that, of why you think Farmer Dick, why it would be profitable for Farmer Dick. Let's say he's starting at 100, if you want to tell a story. Suppose he's currently at 100. Why would it be smart for him to increase production towards 300? Well, he's starting at 100, and then savings 101. He's still getting a problem here. Okay. Good. So, so let, let's let everybody see that. So to the cost of the 101st unit, though. It went, up. it went up. So that sounds bad, right? So the 101st unit was more expensive than the 100th unit, right? So just to put a little meat on the bones here, suppose that it went up to about 20, right? But what? But he's still making three. Yeah, 380 on that. Good. Good math right on the spot. Too. Good. You can go sit down. 
All right, so maybe I should have you stay up, but uh, I'll let you sit down because I was going to just go another. Should he stop there? How about the 102nd unit? Still makes sense? The revenue generated by the 102nd unit is five bucks. The cost of the 102nd unit is less than that. 103rd, 104, 200. Profits are shrinking, bad? Profits are shrinking? I thought we were amazing profits. Still increasing well. So that's the important distinction I want to make sure. What, what? Your total profit is going up. The profit on each additional unit is shrinking, but total profit's going up. So if I'm Farmer Dick, and we think about this in terms of cash, and profits are a pile of cash right here, right? It's like I'm adding $3.80. I go do one more unit, just one more. $3.80 added to the pile. It's bigger. Should I do one more? One more? One more? Well, the 200th unit, shoot, that's going to cost me $2.50. But I go ahead and make it, and then I sell it, and I have profit of $2.50. Yes, that's less than the $3.80 that this one brought in, but what's happening to my pile of cash? So that's the distinction between marginal profit and total profit. Marginal cost can be going up, but as long as it's still less than marginal revenue, you're making the pile bigger. So what happens when we go to 400? What's the cost of the 400th unit relative to the revenue? How much is the revenue of the 400th unit? What's the revenue generated by the 400th unit? $5. And it cost me... Remember, I've got my suffix goggles on. As I'm looking at this and I'm looking at that, ooh, M word. That means this one gets the, right? And the cost of the 400th unit is, what do we got here? Six, let's call it $7. So the 400th unit cost me $7. I sold it for five. I lost two bucks on the 400th unit. In order to pay for it, where did I have to pay for it from it from? My pile of money, my profit that I had before. So now I'm gonna take two bucks out of here to pay the my tractor supply guy and my, my feed supply person, right? My cost of doing business, it's gonna come out of my profit pile. So profits are actually starting to shrink if I go too far. So this ends up being a very important quantity, Q star. It is the quantity that maximizes profit. What I call the holy grail of business. Every business wants to know how to maximize profit. I'm telling you, this is it. This is the real thing. Each decision that's made, if it's treated at the margin, you will be maximizing profit if you analyze the revenue associated with that action versus the cost associated with that action. If the revenue is greater than the cost, do it. If the cost exceeds the revenue, don't. We maximize profits right here where the two intersect. Asher? How can we do that though when the corn market's always changing everything? Okay, well, that, yeah, so I mean, that raises a different question of dealing with uncertainty, which is you're going to have to take my, now you're trying to get out of this institution already, so you're, gonna, you're missing out on my upper division econ classes, uh, but we have some uncertainty of this going up and down, right? So um, we have to make an expectation about the future price. It's kind of the short of the answer. And so you're still going to do the same thing. What do I expect the price to be? But it'll be based on expectations. Now, in other cases, uh, it might be driven by the actual today's market. If you're sitting on an inventory of corn, how much corn should I bring to market today? Or uh, harvesting trees is kind of an interesting example we might get to uh, in the resource markets on Christmas tree time. How many trees should I harvest? You know, I can sell these Christmas trees at $15 this year, but if I let them go to next year, will it be $25? Right? So kind of those, always thinking about marginal revenue versus marginal cost. 
All right, so how should Farmer Vic maximize profit? Here it is, holy grail. <laughs> By producing the quantity, By producing the quantity, which is our little Q star in our example, by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit produced is just equal. Make sure you get that little high pitched squeal in there. Very important. So, by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is just equal to <coughs> the cost of that last unit. So the key point from this was that if marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, are you producing too much or too little? What's that? Too little. Let me let people catch up with that so you guys can track here. By producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is just equal to the cost of that last unit, that means if marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, we're in this region here. And that you should increase production. So if marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, that means increase quantity. If marginal revenue is less than marginal cost, you are overproducing relative to the profit maximizing quantity and therefore decrease quantity. Memorize this statement because it will at different points not make sense. How should a firm and so and then you might add on here, how should a firm maximize profit? Go ahead and cross off Farmer Dick, because this is true for everybody. Whether you're Google or Microsoft, Monsanto, Jack Daniels, everybody. This just makes common sense. This is the economic way of thinking at the margin, right? All right, so um, now the 300th unit has how much profit? Zero. Is, so should we just stop a little, little bit that? <laughs> Is it smart to make zero profit? Kind of ties into this module's test Sunday. Some, some people might think, well, that'd be dumb. You might as well stop at 299 or something. Then you're fine. So if you're not losing money, you're fine. So at least it's zero, you're just breaking even. What's that? Why wouldn't you want to make money? What makes it worth your time would be, right? If you're not making anything, then just don't do it. What did we learn about cost in economics class? What do they always include? Great test question for Wednesday. What do costs in economics class always include, i.e., may not included in Professor Wagner's accounting class? Opportunity costs. Good. So our costs always include opportunity costs. And therefore, when you make nothing in econ class, when you make nothing on the 300th unit, are you actually making something? What are you making? We have a name for it. 
It was called a uh, normal profit. There's a profit built into it. It's called a normal profit. And this will be part of the stuff from this last module. A normal profit. When economic profits for the English professor were zero, remember that example? English professor used to be making 60 grand at OU, quit the business, went in. Eventually, we got to the point where if revenues were at, what was it, 400? 20,000, if revenues were at 420,000, then economic profit was zero. But was the English professor not making anything? No, he was making 60,000. He was making what economists call a normal profit. So zero profits are normal in the sense that they're expected in a competitive environment. We don't expect firms to be earning obnoxious profits, profits that are well beyond their opportunity cost. Because what keeps them from having that happen? What we started things off here today with. Competition. Good. So you're starting to get the linkages, right? <laughs> if there's obnoxious profits being made, i.e. economic profits being greater than zero, i.e. the English professor having economic profit of $20,000, $30,000, people are like, Hey man, I can open up a restaurant if a sneaky English can do it. I can do it, right? If there's abnormal profits. They open up a restaurant, prices start to fall, profits start to fall. How far do they fall? They fall back to what's normal. All right. How much money is Farmer Dick making? How much money is Farmer Dick making? We said that, oh, holy grail. The area, yeah, so this was one unit of profit, and then we got all this. That turns out to be wrong, but very insightful for you to think that. And I'll get into why it's wrong. It's close, by the way. It's kind of a profit, uh, but it's not quite the full profits. Can anybody think why? What's it, what's it potentially missing? Taxes? No, we can in there. So marginal cost. Marginal cost formula is what? Okay, what's that? I? Missing variable cost. It's missing variable cost. I think you're on to something thinking about the distinction. First of all, marginal cost is equal to formula equation goggles. This is where you go flip, flip, flip back in your notes. Where is it? I know we get, he's given it to us multiple times. Change in total cost over the change in quantity. So change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. Now, there was another alternative that I snuck in on. How else can marginal cost be calculated? No, nope, nothing to do with price. It's strictly on cost. It was, and this is going to help you for Sunday, so I'm kind of reviewing a little bit here for your material coming up. There was another formula. Find it in your notes. Change in total variable costs, right? Because fixed costs don't change. So an alternative formula is to just look at your variable costs because those, by definition, are the only things that change. Now, the profit equation, which I've already erased, is what? Total revenue minus total cost. Total cost is total variable cost plus total fixed cost. So another way to think about the total revenue function, I haven't written it this way in class yet, is minus TVC plus TFC, right? Total variable plus total fixed. So we can think about total revenue minus total variable minus total fixed. And now we're really close to having it. There's no total fixed cost. That's right. This graph and this shaded area ignores our total fixed cost. And so it's not quite profits. It's not quite profits. It's part of the equation, but not the whole enchilada. 
what piece of data with our graphing goggles on, what would be nice to have on this graph to answer this question? Average total cost would be awfully nice, right? Average total cost. All right, so everybody draw, I don't know if you did this seven, but I'm gonna go ahead and draw it up here just for fun, but everybody draw, and remember your average total cost curve comes, it's bowl shaped and it bottoms out at the minimum. So wherever you draw it, make sure that it, its minimum point is at where the marginal cost curve intersects the uh, marginal cost and, mar and average total cost intersect each other at the minimum at the big fat dot. So now, how much money is Farmer Dick making? What are you shaking your head for? Give me your name. I like your head shake. I just want to pick on you a little bit. Derek. Derek. You're shaking your head. Does that mean anything? Or did you just have a little pink in your neck? Or? Okay. Like, so how do you calculate that? So at, at Q star, right, at 100, how would you calculate his average total cost per unit? What would you do? Graphically, kind of in your mind, like how are you solving this on a homework problem? Who wants to help him out? You go up, all the way to the go up cost. right? So at each quantity, always go up, hit the curve, hang a left, and read off that number. All right, so I think your gut feeling was good, but we've got to work on those mechanics, Derek. You, you were there. So this is a little bit higher than seven. If this was seven and this is the minimum, then this must be a little bit higher. Let's call it $7.20 just for fun. How much is he selling each unit for, Derek? 300 units. How much is he getting for each unit? What's the price per unit? $5. So Seems to me if we go back to that other profit equation that we had up earlier of price minus average total cost time quantity, we've got ourselves a situation of $5 minus 720 times 300 gives me a negative 220 times 300, which is going to be losing some money here. What do we got? Uh, I can almost do this one in my head, maybe. What do we got? 2.2, what do we got? 6.6. .6. Then we got a couple zeros to add on. So 6.6, .6, but then we got a couple zeros. Turn that into a comma, $6,600. That doesn't sound right. Yeah, it went too far, right? So how much is it? $660. So we got $660 worth of negative money. What do we call a negative profit? A loss. Well, that worked out real good, Professor McCullough. Holy grail of business. That is us. We're losing $660. What's true about that loss, though? How could, what would happen if Farmer Dick tried to fix it? He'd lose more. That's right. So it turns out the profit maximizing quantity is also the loss minimizing quantity. If you're losing your rear end, you will lose the least of it by producing 300 units. If he moves a little bit to the right, the loss is going to get bigger. It's actually the same math that we did earlier. The 400th unit costs more than the revenue generated by it. So it's creating a bigger loss. For over here, we could lose less money by moving this way. Exactly what Drew uh, argued, right? So it's the same logic. So the profit maximizing quantity is also the loss minimizing quantity. In other words, you can't do better by producing any other quantity. Holy grail preserved. Now, it brings up different implications, like what should we do? Yeah, we might want to get out. 
Um, does every farmer, when they lose money, get out of the farming business? No, no farmers are really hard nosed, right? They're like, next year will be better. Next year will be better. Next year will be better. I mean, there's farmers that hang in there for a long time. They'll eat beans and rice and potatoes for a long time because they're not giving up the farms, right? But even those family farms, if they are losing money for 30 years, can they make it? Is that sustainable? Not as an operation, right? So eventually they wear out. Maybe some big commercial farm comes in and says, hey, I'll give you X amount of money for your, for your farm ground, right? And X amount of money because of real estate prices. When great, 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 great grandfather bought it, he bought the land for 200 bucks. It's now worth 2 million, right? And that's no joke. That can, that can happen in a lot of cases. So some of these family farms are sitting on $2 million worth of land. And so from a standpoint of cash flow, some of those farmers may lose a little bit, but this year they made money. But if they had an economist or an econ principles of microeconomics student talking to the farmer, you might say, hey, have you calculated your implicit costs? The lost interest on $2 million? Crap, why should I do that? We just want to keep the family farm. Well, you're losing money. You might be able to financially do better selling the family farm. Because the last time I calculated $2 million at a 10% interest rate, if you were to reinvest it at the stock market, long-term stock market average, and hopefully hope to get 10% on $2 million, you got $2 million, you sold the farm, you put it in the stock market, 10% on $2 million is how much? $200,000. And then you're done, that's all you get is $200,000? $200,000 per year. How many rows did you have to hoe? Zero, right? That's the position that the family farm has been put in over time, is that if they weren't keeping up with the scale of production due to economies of scale, what was that again? I love throwing these curveballs at you. Economies of scale, that was from last that's the end. The part where cost goes down. Cost, some sort of cost starts to go down. What type of cost is it? Nope. Average total, what kind of average total? Short run or long run? Short run. Long run. So long run average costs start to fall as you increase the scale of production. If you have a corn operation, how much is one of those new combines? Those of you from some farming backgrounds, new combine, half million dollars easily, and could be more if you get some new bells and whistles. Half a million dollars. So guess what? How you make money off of a half million dollar investment in a, in a fancy combine? You produce more. Economies of scale. As I increase the scale of production of the farm, and instead of doing a thousand acres, I do 5,000 acres, I can still use that one combine potentially up to a certain point. And so I'm driving down my average cost of that 500,000 each time. <laughs> And so these economies of scale might be driving that result and also starting to other circumstances might be bidding up the land prices, making it kind of an easy decision for some small family farms to sell out. Now, are they bad people for selling out? Of course not. Not to me anyway. I, uh, do something different for your family. Now, I come from a family farm, by the way. My mom grew up on a farm. It's still within the family. And there's only 150 acres. And so my uncle Leon has been uh, renting out the land since he took over. He was the oldest brother. He kind of took over the farming uh, stuff. And so he's just been renting it out. So that's another option. If you want to keep the family farm, just rent it out. And then you've got that rental revenue. Likely the rental revenue is not going to be as good as the sale of the $2 million place and plunking it into an investment but at least you keep the family heritage going and you own the land. All kinds of interesting economics going on with that. All right, so we need to characterize the long run in perfect competition. If this graph 
is correct. And Farmer Dick is a representative farmer. What's going to happen in the marketplace? Get out. Exit. As companies, as farmers start to exit the industry, what starts to happen? What starts to happen? Price will start to go up because what's happening over here in this graph? Supply goes down. One of our supply shifters, chapter three, I thought you should have them memorized. Number of firms was one of those supply shifters. What were some other ones? Who's got those memorized? Expectations. Expectations, good. So expectations and number of firms. You can flip, flip, flip back to that. That was back to chapter three. You're going to have to flip for a little while. A few State pages back. What's that? State of nature. State of nature, yeah. So we have potentially some weather issues and other things. Good. Technology. Technology, great. We're up to four. Price of related, Price of related output, right? Price of related output where... We have farming. So all of those things could cause disruptions. <laughs> all of those things could cause supply curve to increase or decrease. What we're thinking about here is that losses cause exit. Exit means a large number of firms. Again, any farmer dick is just a drop of water in the bucket. But if 40% of the farmers start to leave, right, then we start to see some action happening over here with lots of farmers exiting. Supply goes up. Price goes up, profit or the losses in this case start to shrink. All right, and the question then is what is our prediction under these circumstances? So the long run equilibrium, long run equilibrium, equilibrium, what was that term? That was one we had back, chapter 3 2. Equilibrium, Give me, I gave you one definition that is kind of the most general definition. Equilibrium. Find that. What'd you find? Situation in which there is no Good. A situation in which there's no tendency for change. So long run equilibrium in perfect competition. If we graph that out, do both graphs side by side. I don't want to monkey up what we did over here. Remember you got home base to the left. Supply, demand, big Q. Initial equilibrium market quantity, initial equilibrium price. Firms in perfect competition are price takers. They're going to take the price that's given to by the market. So graphically, how I like to show that is just say, whatever this equilibrium price is, it's going to come over here and create a demand curve. Because the demand curve is perfectly elastic, it turns out to be just equal to the revenue generated by each additional unit. The representative firm is thinking about their little Q they're not sub they are subject to the law of diminishing marginal product which gives rise to the law of increasing costs so some sort of j-shaped marginal cost curve this is the market over here I forgot to draw that the market and then what do we expect those profits to be what is your prediction? I already walked you through the story of firms exiting now. When does it stop? When do they quit leaving? When they start making money again, right? So let's say they leave and now there's positive economic profits. What does that cause? Enter. So now all of a sudden it reverses it. They're like, whoops, too many people left, prices too high, now there's profits. That's gonna cause entry into the market because there's free entry and exit in perfect competition, causing the price to now fall. When does it quit? What is the equilibrium? What is it? What happens in equilibrium? What about each one of these representative firms? How much money are they making? 
zero. A normal profit. Remember, economic profit of zero means that they're earning a normal profit. And so when you draw the average total cost curve in long run equilibrium, you're going to do your bowl, and it's just going to kiss. Just like that. It's just going to kiss the marginal revenue curve and the marginal cost curve intersection point. So all three points are going to cross at that point <coughs> is the long run equilibrium. All firms maximize profits by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last year produced is equal to the cost of the last year. That is this quantity. Little Q star. At this quantity, price equals average total cost. How do I know that? At this quantity, I go up to the average total cost curve, hang a left, boom, it's right there. At this quantity, how much price am I getting? Oh, I go to the demand curve for that information. At this quantity, go up to the demand curve, hang a left, boom, they're equal to each other. Right? So price equals average total cost, which means economic profit is zero. Economic profit equals zero. And this means we've got a normal profit. A normal profit. Um, uh, this graph, before I erase it, I think this, this might be helpful for you, helpful for you to add. Uh, the area that represents the loss that we calculated, the $660. We were producing $300. That gave us this $7.20 price. And so $720 versus the price, price minus the $720 is this vertical height, $2.20. Everybody with me? This height is $2.20. That's our loss per unit times the 300 units gives you this right. And that is the economic loss. And in this case, it was equal to, using the numbers I did, $660, an economic loss of $660. All right, questions on that? All right, so let's kind of give a summary of our long run predictions. <coughs> so, long run predictions. In perfect competition. Long run predictions. Number one, economic profit equals zero. How did we get that result again? What of the three characteristics really gives us that result? What's the driving force? That really gives us that prediction in the long run. Competition, right? So free entry and exit. The ability for firms to leave or come in fairly fast gives us this prediction here. So free entry exit kind of helps give us that answer. Competition, like you said. Now, as a, if you were, you know, God stepping back and looking at this island, is that a good result? That economic profit is zero? 
would you be kind of happy with that result if you were God? I know it's kind of tough to play God's role, but God's role looking down at creation, uh, yeah, economic profits are going to zero. Is that good? Yeah. I see some heads shaking. What, what, why does that seem like a decent result? Everyone's equal. Everyone's equal? Yes. Equally zero? Yes. We're minimizing what? Yeah, the opportunity. So the profits that are being made are no higher than what alternatives are. That's where the equal part kind of comes in for that type of activity. Now, we already know for different activities, profit rates are higher or lower depending on risk, right? So if you're in a real risky business, your average profit rate might be, let's say, 18% if we put it in percentage terms. But if you're in a really safe industry, maybe it's down to 5%, right? And so those people in this industry wouldn't say, oh, I want 18%, I'm going to go jump up there because that's a risky activity, right? So across the board within industries, we have people earning a fair profit, a normal profit, a profit that you'd expect to cover the opportunity costs. Next best alternatives. So this is kind of a good result. I think you can kind of start, to, I, I like to use, and you might put this in quotes, this is Russ, because maybe there'll be some other people that come down my throat on this. But I think this result gives us kind of a quote unquote fair result. And I'll, my justification for that is because profit <coughs> covers the opportunity cost of the next best alternative. So if, if God is trying to reallocate resources, even God can't do better. That's what's kind of amazing. Maybe he designed it that way in the first place. Oh, there's an idea. Think about it. That one's kind of a deep one now. We can spend some time on it, right? So things could be organized such that resources automatically gravitate to their highest and best use on their own in the market system. All right, so that's uh, one result we get. We didn't really talk much about um, our types of efficiency. Number two is productive efficiency, P-E. In terms of the production possibilities frontier, which I happened to put on the board at the top of lecture today when I was looking at education and uh, weapons of mass destruction, points A, B, and C we're all productively efficient. Why? What, 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 what made something productively efficient? You use all your resources. Those are the possible outcomes, meaning you, in order to get more of one thing, you have to give up some of the other, right? Was kind of our definition there. So um, in this respect, we have a, another way of looking at that with this picture. So I want to highlight for you that we're on the edge of the production possibilities frontier. But the new thing I'm going to introduce you today for this chapter is that, or you can think of it being at the minimum of average total cost. Do we get to a point that the production level in the marketplace, big Q over here, the market quantity of corn, if you will, is that being produced? at the absolute minimum of the average cost. Have, have we found the right size? Remember how we did the small, medium, and large plant? You know, do we eventually get to the point where we're minimizing costs? In perfect competition, what do you think? Do we get this minimum average total cost? Yes, because that's what we learned. This is at the minimum of the average total cost curve. So in perfect competition, we get productive efficiency. The other type of efficiency, number, item number three, is allocative efficiency. That was our AE. And this is kind of right in line with what we were talking about, education and weapons of mass destruction. Do we actually end up at point A, B, or C? What did we need for allocative efficiency? Anybody remember that? 
There was something needed. It's kind of back to this chapter three material. It kind of looked like this. Where did we achieve allocative efficiency? In the middle. In the middle, where the two lines cross. Because the supply curve we learned is the marginal cost curve, and the demand curve is the marginal benefit curve. Allocative efficiency occurs where the marginal benefit of the last unit produced is equal to the marginal cost of the last unit produced. So this quantity is indeed allocatively efficient. So allocative efficiency occurs where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So in perfect competition, we get a lot of nice results. And that's why we have laws on the books in the United States that try to enhance, to make sure competition is preserved because of these predictions that we have in competitive markets. As we're going to learn, it's not possible in every market to preserve each one of those three characteristics. And that's where we start to have more fun. All right, we'll see you on Monday. Have a good, have a good weekend. Oh, I forgot attendance. Thank you, Paige. Attention. <laughs> 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 <laughs>